series of violent armored car robberies terrorized New England. Using overwhelming firepower, a gang of gunmen strikes quickly and then vanishes, leaving few clues. When the robbers turn to murder, police race to capture them before they take more innocent lives. But to find them, investigators must first shatter a deadly code of silence. In this program, some of the names have been changed. In the early 90s, a rash of armored car robberies struck New England. 13 occurred in 1993 alone. By the next year, armored car couriers like New Hampshire guards Wes Anderson and his partner Ron Normando prepared themselves for the possibility they could be next. They usually began their route each morning with hundreds of thousands of dollars to be dropped off at local businesses and banks. On this day, they had over half a million dollars in their truck. The men were well aware of the danger in carrying that much money. But in all the previous attacks, none of the armored truck crews were seriously injured. Inside the 12-ton truck, they were practically invulnerable. They were protected by walls of thick armor, strong enough to withstand massive amounts of firepower. The windshield and windows were made of bulletproof glass. The truck was a virtual rolling fortress. But even with all the armor, the trucks were at risk. At 9.10 a.m., Anderson and Normando pulled into the parking lot of a bank in Hudson, New Hampshire. The men were unprotected only when entering and exiting the vehicle. waited for their window of opportunity. Here comes. Then it came. This robbery would be tragically different from the ones that occurred earlier. People in the bank heard the shots. Teller activated the alarm and called police. The robbers had only a few minutes before the police arrived. They wasted no time making their getaway. Witnesses noted the make and model of the maroon minivan as it sped away. They also noticed a white car that seemed to be part of the fleeing convoy. The bank robbery? Where? Where is it? Bank on Lowell Road? They shot a guard? Okay, stand by. Hudson 911 received the call. Be advised, we have a 100 green in progress. Hudson Police Chief Richard Gendron was alerted. It's confirmed. All right, want to notify the captain and have him meet me out back. There was 10 to 15 officers that were in training. We entered the room and said, everybody, you know, uh, get in a vehicle, get your bulletproof vests on. We have an armed robbery in progress. Charlie 1 headquarters in room. As we approached the site, the officers who were on duty were dispatched to take positions around the bank set up some perimeter control. When police arrived at the bank, they questioned the witnesses. 
They couldn't describe the robbers because they wore masks, but they described the getaway cars. We learned that they had just left, and that's the clue, was that uh, um, armored cars don't move that fast. So we knew they had to be still in Hudson. Officers were dispatched to find the missing armored car. Uh, hold up, the Hudson Bank. Witnesses uh, told us that uh, the guards were overpowered. They heard a round go off, they saw the guard go down on the pavement, and then they picked them up and threw them in the back of the uh, armored car. And then uh, there were other witnesses that thought they heard a second shot uh, inside or as they were going into the armored car. From the witnesses' accounts, police determined the gunmen had automatic weapons. They had to find the wounded guards quickly if the men were to survive their injuries. This incident quickly turned from bank robbery to possible homicide or hostage situation. You're now focus, focusing your attention on something totally different. And now you know you're dealing with people who are not afraid to use deadly force. Police set up roadblocks at all the roads in and out of town. With the roadblocks in place, Hudson police began a street-by-street -street search. To widen the search area, they notified New Hampshire State Police and Massachusetts authorities just over the state border. The state police helicopter took to the air to try and locate the armored car. They began by scanning the neighborhood near where the robbery took place and worked outward. At the bank, officers combed the parking lot searching for any evidence that might identify the robbers and give them some idea of where they took their hostages. All they found was Ron Normando's clipboard. The gunmen were careful to leave little else behind. On the roads leading out of Hudson, police kept a vigilant eye out for anything out of the ordinary. like looking for a needle in a haystack. The neighborhood near the bank robbery is, is there's a lot of wooded areas, a lot of places where you could easily drop off uh, a stolen vehicle and, uh, and get away. And um, it also takes us a lot of time to search those areas because um, there's a lot of dirt roads going into them. 20 minutes after the robbery, Police got a break when an officer saw something glinting in the sunlight through the dense woods. As he got closer, he thought he heard the sound of a diesel engine running. When he lowered his window, his suspicions were confirmed. Deep in the woods, he saw the outline of an armored car and a maroon minivan. Chief Gendron warned him to exercise caution. I advised the officer to try to establish some point of surveillance until I arrive with other units. But under no conditions whatsoever, attempt to go in here until backup arrives. We knew we were dealing with professionals. We figured right away that they probably had counter surveillance. They knew we were coming. Uh, they were probably monitoring our frequency. Officers were unable to see through the thick brush to assess the situation. Because they could hear the engines of the armored car and the van running, they thought the gunman might still be inside. The best situation we're hoping for is that those who were responsible for these, this armed robbery would have simply taken the money and left the guards uninjured. Is it possible that the guards are, are just tied up and left there? Is it possible that the robbers are still there, and then the thought comes in that uh, uh, are we ended up in a gun battle. All the officers were wearing bulletproof vests, and one of the patrol cars had a single ballistic shield. They were outmanned and outgunned by the suspects. But knowing the hostages were probably wounded, they did not have time to wait for SWAT to arrive. They had to go in men prepared with what little protection they had. There was only three of us that entered the woods. I made the decision to, to do that. 
basically because we thought there was an urgency to get in there and, and get the guards uh, to save them. It wasn't uh, any one of us that was going in that woods that uh, uh, didn't have the jitters and was wondering what was going to pop out at us. Uh, we didn't know if the uh, if you know the bad guys were hiding in the woods waiting for us and were going to ambush us. We didn't know if uh, they were inside the van. At least they had some protection from bullets. But if the suspects were holed up in the truck with automatic weapons, the shield and vests would be no match for the criminals. They could have easily came out of the woods or any one of those vans and uh, end up in a firefight. They weren't going to hesitate to fire uh, any rounds uh, because they just did it at the bank. The officers found no suspects in the vehicle, only the motionless body of the truck's driver, Wes Anderson. Got a guard down. Next, the officers moved toward the suspect's other vehicle, the maroon minivan. It held an equally gruesome discovery. The dead body of the armored car's courier, Ron Normando. Very clearly, you could see it was an execution. They didn't have to do that. This is probably one of the most horrific crimes we have seen in, in many years. It was a senseless killing of two individuals. The robbery investigation had become a double homicide case. There's a sense that we are going to get these guys. We are definitely going to get these guys, no matter what it takes. Everybody had that mission, was to find them. The area became a crime scene, and the medical examiner was called in. Because the crime began at a federally insured bank, the FBI and U.S. Attorney's Office joined the investigation. Before crime scene technicians could begin their work, the representative from the medical examiner's office had to examine the bodies. But the armored car was still locked. The heat from the running engine might affect the body, making it more difficult to conduct an accurate examination, according to Deputy Medical Examiner Kathy Deschano. We were very concerned about that heat causing artifactual changes in the body and also obscuring our ability to recover critical evidence from that body. So we were very, very wary of leaving those vehicles running. We were very concerned about getting them shut off as quickly as possible and also monitoring what was happening to those bodies because of the heat during the course of that afternoon. They had to get the armored car opened up and turned off. They called for the keys to be brought in. While they waited, Hudson Police and Sergeant Ray Mello took extraordinary measures to preserve the dirt road leading to the vehicles. The decision was made to go through the woods maybe 50, 75 yards up the street and actually uh, take a chainsaw and cut through the woods. Our crime scene people could access the scene that way and we wouldn't be trampling on the, any evidence that was left behind in that dirt road. Since the doors of the maroon van were already open, the medical examiner documented the condition of Ron Normando. He had been handcuffed and suffered multiple gunshot wounds. Duct tape covered his eyes and bound his ankles. He had one gunshot wound to the side, probably sustained at the bank. The other was to his head, an execution wound. This was easily one of the most brutal crimes that I've ever seen in my career. And from that perspective, we knew that we had an uphill job trying to gather evidence and see this to a successful conclusion. Police ran the van's license plate and learned it was reported stolen two days earlier from a New Hampshire shopping center 40 miles away. 
the path to the crime scene was now clear, and the rest of the investigators had access to the vehicles. The van's ignition was damaged. The screwdriver stabbed into the seat was probably used by the suspects to start the vehicle. Police escorted a supervisor from the armored car company to the locked truck. His keys would unlock more horrific evidence inside. While police painstakingly processed the evidence, a gang of heavily armed killers was on the loose. If they could not uncover some clue that would lead to their capture soon, authorities feared more people would die. For the first time in Shark Week history, an underwater film crew captures the unthinkable. Witness the most extraordinary shark footage ever seen. Anatomy of a Shark Bite, tonight at 9, only on the Discovery Channel. All phone jacks are alike. When you plug your computer into it, it takes you to the same internet. So why do others jack up the cost of internet access to twice the price of net zero? Net zero. Internet access. Only $9.95. Go to netzero.com. Judy has a difficult job. It's called Three Kids. She uses her Discover card to buy things, like gas, household supplies, and pudding. Because Discover Card pays her a cashback bonus award, so far she's earned $103. It's money she used to buy herself. A little time off. Discover Card. Why not get paid for the things you buy anyway? There are ordinary disposable razors, but now there's new Sensor 3 from Gillette. Totally new handle, three blades, on springs that adjust to your face. No disposable shapes better. It could be the best disposable you ever threw away. New Gillette Sensor 3. It's the winning season for the Hyundai Sonata. Ranked most appealing entry midsize car by J.D. Power & Associates. Protected by America's best warranty. 10 years, 100,000 miles. $2,100 less than a Toyota Camry when comparably equipped. And now get an extra $1,000 cash back. The Hyundai Sonata starting at just $15,839 after $1,000 cash back. You're the winner at the Hyundai winning season clearance. Going on now at your Hyundai dealer. A special announcement from the Bargain Network. You can buy cars for as low as $500. Choose from thousands of cars repossessed and seized by the U.S. Customs, IRS, FBI, and private organizations. Call 800-311-7730. Foreclosed homes and distressed properties are selling for as low as $199 a month. HUDs, VAs, repos, and more. Through the Bargain Network, I got my dream car, and I saved a lot of money. New cars and homes are being added every day. For listings in your area, call now. 800-311-7730. Call now. There are heavy rains heading toward Chicago. There are going to be flight delays. Send out Orbit's Traveler Care Alerts. Destination Orbits. I'm contacting customers via email and cell phone so they won't have to waste time waiting in the airport. Next, I'll contact their friends and family so they know about the delays, too. Oh, no. My husband will miss our son's birthday party. It's going to be okay, ma'am. We'll have him home in time to light the candles. Another mission accomplished, Care. story will finally be told. Never TV resurrected next Sunday at 9 on the Discovery Channel. In Hudson, New Hampshire, two armored car couriers were shot in a robbery attempt. Hudson police found the armored car in one of the suspect's getaway vehicles in the woods. The guards had been murdered. When investigators opened the armored car, he found only several bags of coins left behind by the robbers. Lying near the money was the body of the second guard. He had been shot once in the leg. The forensics investigator noted two gunshots to his head, suggesting he had also been executed. The guard's body was examined by Kathy Deschanel. He had blood a considerable amount. There was blood everywhere. Um, that speaks to two things. The first is that 
he had to be alive to bleed, so he was laying there bleeding for a period of time. The multiple wounds speaks to the degree of violence. Investigators were finally able to turn off the armored truck's engine and process it for evidence. As professional as the robbers seemed in their operation, they left behind important clues. Sergeant Ray Mello worked the case. We found a mask in the armored car, uh, which was important. It gave us a, a, an idea that one of the suspects may have lost his mask, and uh, potentially that may have been why the, one of the guards was shot, was that he had seen the face of, of one of the suspects. Send it up to the lab. Crime scene technicians sent the mask to the FBI's lab for DNA analysis in the event the suspect left saliva, skin, or hair on it. Police found their efforts to preserve the dirt path leading to the vehicles paid off. The most significant piece of evidence was this uh, tire print. We knew that none of the responding police vehicles had made that, that track. Um, and, you know, having found the armored car, having found the van um, right down the dirt road from where this path was, uh, we had a real good idea at that time that it was probably made by some getaway uh, car vehicle. So uh, a primary importance right away was to preserve that tire trap. To preserve it, evidence technicians would make a mold. Get pictures of everything Once the mold was formed, they would have an exact representation of the tire impression. Technicians could compare it to the tread on any suspect vehicle. Using dental stone, they carefully covered the track. Because each time a tire hits the road, it changes the wear pattern. They'd have to find the vehicle quickly to make an accurate comparison. Officers at the site put out word through the media they were looking for any information on the robbery and murder of the two guards. The news reports were broadcast across the region, according to Hudson Police Chief Gendron. The press was everywhere. Uh, news crews from uh, the city of Boston are coming into the area. We immediately gave them a, a press release on uh, what transpired and kept them informed. And they, in return, gave out information to the general public uh, what we were looking for, description of vehicles, suspects. While the crime scene was being processed, police and FBI agents canvassed homes and businesses near the bank and the location where the bodies were found. They were looking for anyone who might have seen anything unusual. How you doing? The mechanic nearby recalled hearing a diesel engine running in the woods earlier that day, which he thought was odd. He walked over to check it out and saw a yellow rental truck parked in the woods. The mechanic gave police the name of the rental company and a detailed description of the truck. Ray Mello thought they were fortunate he was a mechanic. It was a specific type of moving van. It's called a cab over, uh, which means the engine's kind of underneath the, the cab. He could actually describe uh, the type of engine, how many cylinders. I mean, he was that good just by sound. Troopers continued to broadcast a request for any information about a yellow rental truck or the white car witnessed leaving the scene. That is uh, the largest size, what we believe is a 24 or 25 footer, um, yellow in color, which we denote it is a, uh, is a definite uh, former rental, and, uh, and that's what we're looking for at this point. They got a call from a woman who said she was driving down the road near where the armored car was found when she was nearly hit by an approaching yellow truck followed closely by a white sedan. Her description of the truck matched the one given by the mechanic. Her coming forward kind of confirmed for us this yellow rental van. Again, we saw it at the scene, um, and now we've got somebody seeing it driving away from the scene and away from Hudson. So it gave us an idea of the, at least the direction it was going. The information was given to police officers throughout the region. Police bulletins were sent out to numerous towns uh, on the way from people either going to Boston or coming up to New Hampshire either way uh, looking for this uh, yellow moving van. 
hundreds of these vans were pulled over and uh, checked out, which was good because we knew the information was getting out there and that the law enforcement community as a whole were looking for these killers. No. Just, uh, of all the trucks the troopers pulled over, none of them could be linked to the murders. As night fell, law enforcement could finally remove the men's bodies from the woods. The vehicles were also removed from the crime scene. They had been thoroughly processed. The maroon minivan was covered with gray fingerprint dust. The guards' bodies were transported to the state medical examiner's office. There, Deputy Medical Examiner Kathy Deschanel hoped to find clues to help police track down the killers. We examine the bodies very carefully for physical evidence and remove and um, protect all of the physical evidence that we can. Because it was obvious to us that there had been physical contact between perpetrator and victim, we wanted to do everything possible to recover anything that might have been on the victims. One of the first things medical examiners look for are fingerprints left on the victim's skin by the perpetrator. I'm preparing a mixture of magnetic black powder and blitz green fingerprint powder. This is what we use to do latent prints on the skin. If you use magnetic powder, you don't actually have to physically touch the skin with anything but the powder. You need just enough fluorescent powder so that you can fluoresce the minutia under the lights. Okay, so that's set up and ready to go. You get a clump of powder affixed to a magnetic wand and you literally drag the powder across the skin. And if there is a print there, the powder will adhere to it and you can develop the print. We were able to see right away that he had some very significant finger marks on his arms. Looks like somebody grabbing him and pulling him or trying to put it, pull his arms behind right. him. I just want to take a look, though. I don't see any minutiae, but I want to look very carefully. You tend to see little fragments of the skin ridges, and there's absolutely none. They're totally smooth. Kathy Deschano pursued every possible piece of evidence. It was important to us to do the absolute best that we could do with every bit of tools and, and every bit of knowledge that we had in our arsenal so that we could get the best possible information for law enforcement so that they could then take it the next step and try to identify who did this and capture them. The medical examiner used a black light to see the prints. I can see the three imprints, but they're extremely smooth. Whoever did this was wearing gloves. There's not one, one shred of ridge imprint down there. Unfortunately, the marks weren't much help. Frustration comes in not being able to find something that readily ties these gentlemen to a particular perpetrator or a particular weapon. We did everything scientifically possible and humanely possible in that morgue to secure every minute piece of evidence, every microscopic piece of evidence that we could have. As the medical examiner continued her work, investigators were still no closer to finding the killers. Experts say unprovoked sharks don't bite. And as long as we don't move around, they just mind their own business. This